Cheers. Look. Smell. Tree. Bird. Bird. Bell. Touch. Taste. Look. Smell. Tree. Fish. Bird. Bell. So do as the poet says and listen. And listen. And listen. And listen. And listen. And listen. Hello everyone, how are you? Welcome, welcome to Stephen Terrace. I'm the Events and Development Coordinator at Glasgow Building Preservation Trust. Hope you like our trailer there. We were gifted a wee line from Liz Lockhead uh, from her poem, A Nonsense Spring for Not for Molly, uh, to celebrate our Sensory City theme this year. Um, so this is the 34th edition of Glasgow um, Growth Open Days Festival, which has been run by the since 1990. In every region of Scotland, and I encourage you to check the national website, which is organised by the Scottish Civic Trust, storesopendays.org.uk, and find out what's on in the regions around you. We're very grateful to the University of Glasgow for hosting us here in this amazing building, the Advanced Research Centre, and I'd like to say a big thank you to Cassie Dillon and to Zara Gladman for all their help in the hub. The ARC is the home of collaborative research at the University of Glasgow. We want to bring researchers, partners, and ideas together from across the campus, the city, and beyond. The ground floor, we're here now, is open to the public all year round and hosts a wide range of activities. So I encourage you to make coming up to the ARC part of your daily commute if you're around the area. And you know, a QR code and um, just at the front entrance where you can scan that and sign up to the mailing list and find out what's happening in this amazing building through the year. This weekend, the ARC is going to host Explorathon, um, and that's a program of events celebrating some of the research that's going on in this building. And you can see one of the first exhibitions just gone up last and site on. Um, we've got a really huge program this year, it's about 270 events if you include all the digital things. So if something you're hoping to go to has become fully booked, don't be discouraged, go on to the website um, find that no booking necessary category and the in-person events has got loads of things you don't need to booking for. The events at the Festival Hub still have tickets for them, so make sure to look at that Festival Hub to have other programs for you. I'd like to say a really huge thank you to our funders, to Glasgow City Council and to Glasgow City Heritage Trust our sponsor Dentons and to all of our sponsors who make this event possible and who keep it free. Thank you to our amazing volunteers who welcomed you today um, and without whom the festival would not be possible. If you feel like making a donation to help us keep the event free, you can do so by texting doors open to 785. Text costs five pounds plus one standard rate message. And those details are on the screen behind me just now. Um, you can also make a cash donation by making a donation to one of the buckets of volunteers have brought on your way out. Um, or if you'd like to make a donation with a card, we also have a machine at the way. I really hope you enjoy the event this evening. We want to hear what you think. We want you to help us make the festival better each year. So we have a festival survey. And the volunteers will be able to give you a flyer on your way out. It's a QR code on the front of the flyer that will link you to the home page of our website. There's a link there to take you to the survey 100 million eyes for one lucky winner for a Glasgow local business. So please do tell us what you think. And the link there will event a fire alarm. The exit's just behind you across the foyer, and the master point is just. 
So on to tonight's event. I'm very pleased to introduce Neil Murphy, Director at Glasgow City Heritage Trust. Neil has nearly 20 years experience as an architect and is heavily involved in heritage conservation and community issues in Glasgow, being current chair of Government Hill Maps Preservation Trust, the largest meanwhile use in Scotland, and vice chair for the Pollock Shields Trust, community anchor organisation following the Make Your Mark East Pollock Shield in Port Eglinton Charette in 2015, which Neil helped secure funding for. Previously, Neil has been Chair of Pollock Shields Heritage, Planning Convener for Pollock Shields Community Council, and a member of the Glasgow Urban Design Panel. Between 2016 and 2018, he was invited by the Minister for Local Government and Housing to be a member of the Development Management Working Group for the Scottish Government's Planning Review. Neil has won the Glasgow Doors Open Days Excellence Award uh, for Inspiring City Tour in 2017, and Glasgow Doors Open Days Above and Beyond Award in 2014. Sir Robert Lorimer Award for Selection and in addition to nominations for the Salt Career Award and GIA Award, was nominated for the Scottish Civic High Place Award for Civic Champion in 2015. Neil regularly lectures on architecture, heritage, and even English. Hey everyone, I don't really want to be on this stage, so I'm going to stand off to the side because I want to see my slide because I think it's that way. Um, and this is sort of um, this is the first time I'm going to see the But we'll see how it goes. I have a full 90 seal rate, so it may get fairly fast at times. I would have all been holding it fast. Everyone, give me your name. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, okay, all right, figure that out. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so I've got that linky slides, so it may get fairly fast at times, but a lot of them are building things, and that's really okay, but appreciate it. Um, but let's get going, we'll send off the side over here. Right, okay. Right, okay, the Glasgow City Improvement Trust and the transformation of the Victorian city. Um, just, I've been wanting to do this lecture for, for a wee while. Um, Glasgow City Heritage Trust is kind of lucky. We're based on Bell Street, right in the heart of the Merchant City. And so we're one of the streets that was hugely affected by what the Glasgow City Improvement Trust did to Glasgow's kind of ancient medieval heart. Um, and so I'm always conscious of that when I walk into work every day that the city was completely transformed. And it's basically unrecognizable except for a few key buildings. But what it was prior to 1866. And that the scope of that transformation is so huge, but it's so kind of integral to how we visualize Glasgow nowadays that I really wanted to do something about this at some point and to also really make clear one of the, the key characters in this as well, who I think should be much more celebrated in Glasgow because very much Glasgow's image of itself in architectural and kind of urban terms very much stems from this one man who we'll be talking about during this talk. This talk. So let's get going. Right, first off, the impact of explosive city growth on Glasgow. So this is a, it's a population phenomenon um, that happens and in Glasgow was particularly pronounced in the kind of mid to late Victorian era. And that has a massive impact on the city and it's how that's handled over time. So we'll accelerate through time here but essentially, this is Roy's military map in Scotland, 1752-5, to five, so which shows the extent of Glasgow just after the Jacobite Rebellion. So it gives you an idea of the city. And at that time, city's population roughly about 45,000. So accelerating forward again, James Barry's plan for Glasgow's second new town, which is where George Square is at the heart of. So 1792, population by that point, 66,000. So, when you're reaching, this is 1856, and the first of the Ordnance Survey, 25 inch to, to the mile, first editions, gives you an idea of just how enormous Glasgow's growth has been by that point. And particularly, if you look at, at where, um, where Glasgow Cross is, if I can get the point to work, and everyone see that? Okay, so that's Glasgow Cross in there. If you look at all the kind of the fennels and the closes all of that, 
you can see, I mean, it's this in incredible kind of organic pattern. This is where David I kind of sets out this idea of the high street being the spine in the city. And Glasgow, basically, essentially, is kind of a dumbbell. You've got the, the religious hub up where the cathedral is. You've got the mercantile heart where Glasgow Cross and Trongate is. And it takes 500 years to kind of connect the two. And off those, you get all the rigs, which were originally agricultural, but gradually get filled up with tenements and townhouses. And so it takes 500 years to connect the two. And you've got Glasgow University sitting right in the middle of the two as well. And that whole, that whole layout, particularly when you're dealing with the Scottish Enlightenment, is really important because part of what was so brilliant about what Glasgow University and the lecturers did at Glasgow University was they allowed the lectures and the topics in the lectures to spill out into the pubs and the restaurants around the university and to all of these small places. And so the Enlightenment was fueled by alcohol from that. So, you know, that, that was a key thing. So the city fabric actually really helped things like the Scottish Enlightenment. But by the time you get to this point in 1856, Glasgow is hugely overcrowded. So there are major issues with population health. So by this point, the population is 362,000. So this is uh, Thomas Solomon's perspective of the city, just to give you an idea of the physical form of the city by 1864. And again, population by this point, circa 430,000. So it's getting, it's getting you know, denser and denser. And this is the key issue. Around that ancient medieval heart of Glasgow, 50,000 people. It, 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 it depends. Some people think it was more up to about 75,000. 50 to 75,000 people are living right in the heart of the city, which is greater than um, the current population of the whole of the city centre which is roughly about 20,000 at the moment. So incredibly dense and tight. So to give you an idea of how bad that is, this is William Tennant Gardner, who is a key figure in all of this. So he's the first person to link overcrowding to unsanitary, you know, insanitary and health conditions. So he, he forms the link between the two. And that's when people realize they have to do something about the ancient part of Glasgow. It's too overcrowded. So by this point, the closest off the high street are exceeding 1,000 people per acre. So to give you an idea of how bad that is, Hong Kong, I'm originally from Hong Kong, Mong Kok in Hong Kong, which is a fantastic street market called Temple Street, street Market, which runs through it, is the most densely populated neighborhood in the world. And that operates at 526 people per acre. So Glasgow is really out there at this point. It is the worst slum in Europe by this point, by the center, the center of the city, conditions are so bad. So they have to do something about it. And there's this great quote from Frederick Engels in The Conditions of the Working Class in England from 1844. This is a parliamentary quote describing what the conditions were like in the closes of the high street and of the salt market and how bad things were and how kind of many people were crowded into a room. And, you know, it's, it's, it's so bad that you wouldn't stable your horse in it. So um, it's, a, it's astonishing to read things like this. But it gives you an idea of what it's like. And the consequence of that, things like the, the, the lack of sanitation, the lack of drainage, um, it means that typhus and cholera are seriously bad. Thousands of people have been killed in epidemics across Glasgow as, as, a, as a consequence of this. And it doesn't just stay within the heart of the city. It spreads out across the city as well. So people are terrified of things like this and they realize that they have to do something about it. And so to give you an idea of what that city was like, is that's a city that has now effectively disappeared. Um, this is the heart of it. So this is Trongate. This is the original Tontine Hotel. So that's the, the, um, the original kind of um, city chambers effectively. And that's where the tobacco merchants were. Um, so they had their, their coffee shop was in the arches underneath that. They would sweep people out of the way off that pavement in front. So that gives you a kind of feel for that. And that's all modern, modeled on what was the best architecture at the time in, in, in London. So it all brought back up to, to, to Glasgow to kind of give an idea of the city's aspirations. But, you know, this is, that's kind of um, early Georgian. So if we keep going, these are Thomas Allen's photographs that were taken at that time when uh, the city improvement was first set up. And it gives you a real feel for what the area is like. Now, the key thing to look at in this particular photograph is look at the cross section of the street. Do you see how Trongate is actually rectangular in cross section? And we'll come on to this later, the changes that they actually managed to do in the heart of the city. So this is High Street. So this is just down from where um, Glasgow University is on High Street. And you can see 
um, the, the uh, toll booth steeple away in the distance. So and it gives you a feel again for how busy the streets become, even busier still, the salt market. Look how busy it is. And that's why you get things like the Britannia Panopticon, because all of these people who are crowded into the heart of the city, they need to be entertained somewhere. And so that's, you know, that's what you did for your entertainment. Um, and it just gives you a feel for the place. And when you think about, and I want you to kind of really think about this, Thomas Allen, when he's going and taking the photographs, when he's doing his survey for the City Improvement Trust, he's having to go into all these closes, these wee vettles, and they are hugely overcrowded. There's no proper kind of drainage or anything to kind of sweep stuff away. Yet still, they kind of look remarkably clean. But when you think about all of the equipment, the kind of the size of photographic equipment at the time, the size of your camera, how long it would take to take a photograph. he would have been stuck there for quite a while. Can you imagine how these places smelled with all that kind of density of population? They must have absolutely stank. And he would have to put up with all of this. And John Carrick, who was um, Glasgow's um, city architect, who we'll get onto in this talk, he also had to survey all of these things too. So him and his team, they must have had to put up with these conditions, but just think people are living in that all the time. That's their life, they're working in it. You know, these were dreadful conditions. Something had to be done about it. So they're really, these are fantastic photographs. And they're very unusual as well. They were actually, there was an exhibition in the, the, the Getty uh, Museum in LA um, just before um, COVID hit of these photographs because they're so unusual for that period. And this shows how enlightened Glasgow was that the city authorities were prepared to document all of this in advance of sweeping it all away. So how did they go about tackling this? Where did they get their ideas from? So first off, there are a series of key figures involved in this. So Lord Provost John Blackie, now he's the kind of the moral force behind it. So he is, he's a, he's a wee free. Um, so he feels it is his moral imperative, it's like a Christian duty to do something for the poor in the city and to solve these problems for the poor in the city. So he's interesting because he's not coming from it from a money point of view. So for him, it's much more, this is a religious thing to do. It's important that they have to, they have to start reforming the city. So next up, John Carrick himself. So an absolutely key figure in the evolution and development of Glasgow. So um, he becomes Glasgow city architect, but he goes through several roles in, in order to get there. And it's him who is critical in writing things like the, the Glasgow City Improvement Act in 1866, but he's also involved in earlier acts as well, which are to do with sanitation, to do with things like controlling the size of the, the rooms in which people are living to, to try and control the overcrowding within the city. So he's absolutely critical for that. He's also critical for things like the, 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 the streetscape that we appreciate in Glasgow now, where you have the four-story datum for tenements and the width of the streets, that all comes from his thinking. And the appearance of the city, that Glasgow is a classical city, is largely down to him and his training. He's a rationalist. He really cares about the plan. The elevation is secondary and how he's thinking, but he's completely rational about things. So the whole appearance of what happens in Glasgow, not just in the heart of the city, but elsewhere too, is all down to him because he is able to control all of this through building regulations and through oversight of you know, any plan for development that's forward in the city. So he's absolutely critical. Then the next man is William Gardner, who's the chief medical officer. And this is the first time such a post had been created, not just in Glasgow, but elsewhere too. So he's a critical figure as well. He's the first person I said earlier who establishes the link between overcrowding and health. And so they need to do something about it. And so what the three of them do is they begin writing what they call the, the, the City Improvement Act. But as part of that, they decide to lead an expedition to Europe to find out what the Europeans are up to and are there any lessons they can learn to bring back to Glasgow. And they start off in Brussels, they move to Amsterdam, Brussels, and then finally land in Paris. And Paris is an absolutely critical thing for this. So, and this is who they are inspired by. This um, kind of he's rather suave looking gentleman, um, Baron Haussmann, who is redesigning Paris for Napoleon III. So this is the French Second Empire. So he's an absolutely critical figure. And reports on what was happening in Paris began to kind of percolate back to the United Kingdom in about 1860. And so they're picking up on all of this. And so his plans for what he wants to do with Paris are absolutely critical to this. 
And it's a complete re-envisaging of Paris. And what they want to do is take the kind of, you know, the, the landscapes you get around Versailles, which Le Notre, the great um, French landscape architect, did around Versailles, where you get these great axes that kind of cover the landscape. They're basically taking those ideas and they're bringing them back into Paris and they're carving these routes through Paris. Part of it's to do with controlling the poor and military and kind of trying to control revolutions um, in, in France via this, so you can control a Parisian mob. Um, but it's also to do with sanitation and letting air and light into the city. That at this point, um, the Victorian kind of thinking about health was that you know, ill health came from miasmas. And so if you, brand, if you brought in sunlight and air, it would sweep the miasmas away. It wasn't until later that they realized that cholera actually came from water. Um, and that, they, they, that link was formed. So this is what they were trying to do then. So he's basically trying to completely rethink Paris. Um, and it's hugely inspiring, but at the same time, it requires the destruction of the ancient city. So Paris is basically, they form these huge avenues through it, and then they beautify these avenues with very simple and elegant tenement and commercial building designs. And again, Baron Hasman has real control over that. So he's kind of like a megalomaniac planner. Um, which is something that John Carrick aspires to be. So if we keep moving, this, it's all kind of caught up in popular culture as well. So you've got this fantastic novel, Emma Zola's um, La Curie, or The Kill, which is a really enjoyable kind of romp through that era in kind of Paris's history. And it's quite salacious. There's, it kind of culminates in a seduction scene that happens in a hot house. So it doesn't really pull its punches, but it's all to do with the corruption that was happening in Paris at that time, that people were figuring out what um, Baron Hasman's plans were, where the, where the routes were going to be, where he was going to be selling off the land from the buildings that got demolished, and they were speculating on the back of that, and fortunes were there to be made. So it was all to do with that kind of corruption. I've always wondered whether the equivalent thing would have happened in Glasgow, with people trying to figure out the same thing too in Glasgow. The kind of Glaswegian equivalent to that is Guy McCrone's Wax Fruit Trilogy, which is well worth a read. It's a wee bit soapy, but it's all to do with how this family kind of rise up through Glasgow at that time. So this is from the 1860s into the 1870s and beyond up till the First World War. So a really interesting series of books. Guy McCrone was heavily involved in the Citizens Theatre. So he's a very interesting man, but he really captures that kind of period really well. And in the first book, there's this whole scene where um, the grandmother of the family is living off Monteith Road. So she lives in very posh Monteith Road, but the, the grandchildren have to be taken across town to the, um, the family's new residence, which is up near Rotten Row, and their business is in candle rigs. And so the, the, the servants have to take the children across salt, the salt market, which is like scary territory. And one of the children gets kidnapped and the cousin, um, this kind of brave young girl, ends up having to go in and rescue her, her, um, her, her niece um, for, so from, from these kind of, you know, these dreadful conditions around the salt market. So it really does, it's very evocative and it gives you a feel for what the city was like at the time. But nevertheless, Glaswegians are kind of right to be slightly suspicious of what's going on with the, with the, the City Improvement Trust and the Act because the whole thing was also linked into railway speculation as well, what the railways were doing as they came into the heart of the city. So this is McClure McDonald's map of, of the city of Glasgow in 1866. And you can see on it both the intended railway lines that were coming into the city, but also the key routes that John Carrick was going to carve through, because this, all, that was what the act was about. Didn't just give him control over the building and the speculation of land, and didn't just give him money in order to buy whole sections of the city, and they end up, they end up controlling about 88 acres of the, the city as a consequence of this. It also allowed him to kind of, you know, carve these new roads to introduce both air and light, but also the, the new water supply that was coming from Loch Catron and also new sewage works and, and sewage as well to kind of properly drain the city. So it allowed him to do all of this at the same time. It's all recorded in this map. So and this is the thing with the Lord Provost. Blackie is the exception because he's, he's, it's his moral duty. The other Lord Provosts are largely tied into the railway companies. So they are speculating at the same time. And so even though John Carrick had all these kind of um, regulations that he was laying down, there were certain instances where the railway companies are able to overcome this. So things like there's the huge warehouse on Bell Street, the six story high enormous warehouse, 
how does that get through? And it's because, you know, one of the railway companies wanted to do it. And so um, Carrick's original plan for that area was to have, Glasgow has a missing square at that point. That was supposed to be Watson Square. So um, we'll come onto it later at Gobel's Cross, but it was supposed to be kind of a rotated square so that you had two streets kind of bisecting across it. And it was going to be a north-south link from the Gallagate up to Glasgow Cathedral. And it never materialized because the railway company stepped in and bought you know, Glasgow University's land and transformed it into two railway goods yards instead. So they were over, they, able, they were able to circumvent him. So it didn't quite go according to plan. But nevertheless, these are all the kind of the key parliamentary acts which dictate how Glasgow was built from this kind of period onwards up to the up to the First World War. So which dictate things like height of buildings, the size of rooms, what the elevations are to look like, how the few is to work. So it's all, this is really fascinating stuff. Um, and it's interesting, well, they obviously, they get control of this. And what they are doing effectively is property speculation. So one of the first moves they make is to, because what they are thinking with um, Glasgow University in particular, there'd be no kind of um, works done to Glasgow University since the turn of the 19th century. And they've been petitioning Queen Victoria for, you know, um, the ability to kind of overhaul their campus without success. And so they took the money from the, um, from the railway companies and they moved out to the West instead. And so Carrick was thinking that he was going to get a fabulous passenger station on the site. And of course he gets nothing like that. He ends up getting his two huge college good yard stations instead. Um, but the consequence of that is he wants to break Ingram Street through to High Street so that he can form this Parisian kind of boulevard through the heart of the city. And so he's able to buy up all the land to allow him to do that. And it's the cost for the land and the demolition of the buildings is actually the expensive bit. The cost for the actual creation of the, the road itself, the kind of cobbled road, the granite pavements, all of those kind of things is not that expensive by comparison, but he's able to sell off the land that results from either side of this new road, and he he makes a profit from doing that. And so he shows that he's able to make a profit and that this is a profitable thing for the city. And so this is how he's applying all these various acts. And by the time you get to the 1892 Ordinance Serving Act, you can begin to see how the city is kind of, is being thinned out, the population beginning to move. And this is kind of one of the great ironies of the City Improvement Act. Because they're buying up all these, these buildings, and they're not actually building new buildings, they are displacing all of the urban poor. So they don't actually solve the problem, they're displacing the urban poor, but they also at the same time become the city's largest slum landlord. So they're meant to be solving these problems, but they are part of the problem at the same time. Um, but you can see from this how they're starting to form new streets and roads. So Bell Street, for instance, extends across to the east and it's massively widened. Look at what's happening with Trongate. Remember, remember what I said earlier about Trongate being rectangular in section? Look at it there, how it's now, it now becomes a triangle instead. So you can see how it's forming. The reason for that was to create easier, easier routes coming through there for both the railway line, the Argyle line that runs underneath Trongate, and also for the trams, to get the trams through more readily as well, because it lines up with London Road rather than London Road having to step into Trongate. So it's things like that that they're kind of looking at. So, and that shows that kind of in closer detail. So you can see how compared to the 1856 Ordnance Survey map, um, the city is, is beginning to lose its complexity. So as the population moving out, as they're dealing with all of the kind of the really tight closes, and they're building much bigger buildings in its place. So it's, it's beginning to lose its complexity. You can also see how the, how the railway lines have been threaded through it as well. So and this is by the time you get to 1910, it shows the impact of the huge um, college good yards. And this again, one of the great ironies of the act. Having been to Paris, one of the things that Carrick was hugely impressed by in Paris was how the Parisians were able to construct while they were building these new, new roads across their city, were able to link them to green spaces across the city to help bring in light and air and green space and amenity into the city. And so that was what he intended to do in Glasgow as well. But the great irony is that with Glasgow University, there was a huge park at the back of Glasgow University, which you could have let people get access to, and it ends up being a goods yard instead. So, which is kind of self-defeating. But at the same time, he's, he, is, he is working things like Cathedral Square doubles in size and gets filled full of trees. So that, you know, is a new means to up there. But they complain when they come back from Paris that they've realized that between kind of um, uh, Glasgow Cross 
and Paisley Road, the toll on Paisley Road West, there is no green space within which you can erect an obelisk or a statue, and it's not good enough, and they're going to do something about it. So it kind of shows that it didn't all quite go according to plan, but it's still quite interesting what they come up with. So again, by the time you get to this stage, unfortunately, Carrick, um, he dies in 1890. His health is not good by this point. And so his successor is his, his assistant, Alexander Beath MacDonald, who is, he's not an architect, he's an engineer, but he's still, he's very good as a designer. And he surrounds himself by a group of very capable designers as well. So we're just dealing with that kind of um, the City Improvement Trust work not his other work. I want to do a separate lecture at some point on MacDonald, um, partially because being the chair of um, Governor Bass Building Preservation Board, Trust, he's, he's notionally the architect of the building. His names are on the drawings, but because he was the head of the department, his names are on all the drawings. So you have to tease out who actually did what. Um, so, but he's a really interesting figure as well. And he's also key for things like, and it sounds incredibly mundane, but Glasgow sewage system, which was the best sewage system outside of London at that time. So an incredible innovation in the city, which of course nobody notices because it's all underground. So let's move forward. So what did they build? So, and this is the key thing. What ended up happening was they were speculating and in the 1870s, that was a good thing because the money was easy in the 1870s, up until about 1876, when Glasgow started to go into an economic recession. And then things get much worse in 1878 with the collapse of the City of Glasgow Bank. And the collapse of the City of Glasgow Bank until Northern Rock collapsed in 2008, the collapse of the City of Glasgow Bank, which had been illegally lending money in the, the New York money markets, um, was the worst financial collapse of any bank in the United Kingdom. So and it wiped out whole families and businesses across the city. And you can see the change in the character of Glasgow on the back of that, because prior to that, you didn't get bay windows and tenements, for instance. And things like red sandstone, that all comes after the, um, the collapse of the, the city of Glasgow Bank. And it takes Glasgow about the best part of a decade to recover from that. And so you get things like the city chambers, and the movement of the Merchant House into George Square, things like that, those are pump priming exercises for to get Glasgow's economy going again. I mean, the city chambers at today's money cost something like half a billion pounds. So um, it's a phenomenal amount of money to spend to get the city going again. So, so anyway, essentially, because they were speculating so much, they weren't actually building stuff and people were being shifted out of the city centre. So they get taken to uh, an 1885 parliamentary committee on the condition of the um, housing for the working class. And um, it's by this point, it's Lord Provost James Morrison, and he has criticised at this, at this committee for not building enough housing for the poor in Glasgow. And so they're forced to do something about it. And so they start building because they realise that developers aren't acting quickly. So they have to start building for themselves. And this is what they start to build. So if you first of all look in the area around the salt market, and you can see how, from Solomon's perspective, just how dense it is around there. So, um, and he builds, this is the first tenement they build. So this is their model tenement. Um, and it's interesting as well, because notionally this is for the poor, but in actual fact, the way that the rents are set, it's really much more for artisans than actual, the genuine poor in Glasgow, most of whom are just completely displaced. So. Um, when, the, when the railways are being built and when all this work, the demolitions are happening in the heart of the city, something like 70,000 people are displaced as a consequence of that. But very few of those people end up getting let back in. And such is their concern over the, the conditions in these buildings and the, the, their desire to kind of um, keep them respectable, they actually, with this particular tenement, they have both a concierge and then weirdly inside, and I'd like to get inside to have a, have a look and see, they had um, separate toilets on each landing for male and female, and you're thinking, why don't they just put the toilets in the houses? You know, why don't put them in the flats? Why, why, put, the, why put them on the stair? Um, so it is, it's a bit odd, but this is the first time they've tried something like this. And they actually, again, they send delegations around the UK before they do anything like this. So they, they're, they're going down to London to see what the Peabody Trust are up to in London. They're going down to Liverpool to see the terraced houses, but they opt ultimately for tenements in Glasgow. They decide that tenements really suits Glaswegians the best. And there's huge debate amongst architects in Glasgow at that time. People like James Salmon Sr. Um, he really would much rather have suburban development on the outside of the city and kind of garden cottages for workers who would then have to commute back into the city, which kind of is similar to how the 20th century eventually went. Um, but then you have other people like um, 
John Honeyman, um, Charles Ray McIntosh's boss, who argues that there shouldn't be limits on kind of the, 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 these four-story datums for tenements, that in the heart of the city, the tenement should be going to seven or higher stories to get a maximum amount of housing that you can to house the poor. Um, and it, it ends up, John Carrick kind of decides, no, he's sticking to his guns, four-story datums, that's it. And that's where you get the character of Glasgow from. And so this is a really good example of kind of Carrick's, he's quite um, an economical architect. So he's very pragmatic. So this is a good example of his style, um, but there are some interesting cues to it because he's trying to hark back to kind of the medieval qualities of the street. So, and if you look at that gable in particular, you can see how it echoes some of the buildings that were getting demolished. So it is kind of, it's, it's I don't want to use the word pastiche, but it is a homage to what was there beforehand. Um, and he also works into it things like, and this again, this is a motif throughout some of the buildings that they use. They work in symbols from the Union. So you get the English rose, the thistle, and then the, the clover for Ireland all get worked in as motifs on these buildings. So you find them at various points in the buildings, and these, these are quite high up on these buildings. So let's move on to Trongate. And in Trongate, this is a successor by this, by this point. Um, so Alexander Beef MacDonald is producing this French Renaissance tenement, which is incredibly grand. And all this is kind of important as well, because they're also getting criticized too, that they're spending far too much money on the beautification of the city and not necessarily on what they're meant to be doing with housing the poor. So it's all to make Glasgow look good. And indeed, this tenement proved to be hugely popular. And it was a, it was a tenement that only a certain class of people could get into. So they're actually quite big flats in those ones. But the shops at the ground floor was hugely popular as well. So uh, by this point, McDonald knew he was onto a good thing. And it was all geared to the design of the, um, the, the Argar line, which sits in front of it. So the station originally, where you've got that kind of ventilation, oops, sorry, let's go back, where you've got that, that ventilation slot there, that was where the original um, station was for Glasgow Cross. It sat underneath there. So that was a, a Sir John James Burnett design station. The platforms are all still there at low level. It's just not used, which is, I, I can't fathom why they decided to move the station to Argyle Street in front of Marks and Spencer's. Because to me, when you actually look at how the stations along the Argyle line are spread out, they're all in pedestrian distance from each other. And by moving it, which presumably was to make the trains move faster in the 1970s, they actually destroyed that pattern. And it's too close to Central Station now. It doesn't, doesn't make sense. Um, but this was obviously the thriving hub of the city at that point. And so they were able to convince um, Sir John James Burnett, this, that's the screen wall at um, the Tron Theatre, which is this really beautiful Baroque wall. And that just hides the ventilation shaft down to the railway line down below. So, but they were able to kind of convince him to design that of uh, quality, which he would be doing anyway, because he was such a good architect, um, to, to tie in with McDonald's tenement next door and also to complement the, 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 the Tron steeple. So, right, if we look at King Street, Parney Street, and Oswald Streets, because these are all hugely changed as consequences. I mean, they're incredibly dense when you see them in Solomon's perspective there, and all completely cleared out and started again. So, and this again is the kind of grandeur you get. It's a B-listed tenement. So real kind of Scottish baronial, really he's pulling out all the stops for this one because he's on the Tron gate and he has to act as though he's on the Tron gate. It's this key, you know, heart of Glasgow. You have to behave like you're in the heart of Glasgow. You have to be posh. And so even though he's designing for technically these are working class tenements, they are incredibly posh to look at. And then as he goes down King Street, they get simpler and simpler. So, which is quite interesting. It's still, um, McDonald's still designing these, but they're still quite grand in their own way. They're really nice tenements. And then beyond that, you get John McKissick, designing much plainer tenements on Piney Street. And John McKissick, he was the partner of William Gardner Rowan, who did lots of really good um, churches around Glasgow. And I really, because I came, came to that partnership via, um, via Rowan, having conserved a couple of his churches, I really admired Rowan's work. He's a really good architect. And he used to do these beautiful little illustrations in the corner of his drawings to show the guys on site what he was looking for, a particular paint style inside, you know, anything like that. He's really interesting. But they ended up dividing up their partnership going separate ways because Rowan couldn't handle tenement work because he thought it was beneath him. And at the time I thought, oh, well, McKissick must be the lesser talent. 
Um, and now I realise I'm completely wrong. That actually, McKissick was just as talented as Rowan was, and that Rowan was just being a snob. Um, and these tenements are actually really good, and they're rock-faced tenements, but he incorporates into this things like, a, a, you know, baths and a steamy for the people who live in the tenements. So it's all really well worked through. When you think there was no sanitation beforehand, all of it suddenly appearing. And yes, okay, the city is being thinned out in terms of population, but the buildings are actually really quite grand and commensurate. And even though they are quite severe compared to other parts of the city, I really admire them. So, but then on the other side of King Street, McKissick wins the competition for two huge warehouses. They adjust their program as they're going along, because obviously by this point, St. Ina <clears throat> Station has been built, and you've got the goods yard next to St. Ina Station. So they are, rather than building tenements there, they decide to build huge warehouses instead, which have now become, that's 103 Trongate, which is now for its artist studios inside there. And then that's the, the SAS block, which was for WASPs, which has been completely overhauled by Nord, architects called Nord. Um, so these are all for artists now, but they're just the most superb buildings and they're really good fun. And I just really admire what, you know, what he's capable of here. Um, he's always a really good architect. And it's difficult to visualize now because obviously St. Ina Station is gone, but St. Ina Station was like raised up a whole floor. So actually that building was to respond when you see it from its south elevation where the huge car park now is, that was to respond more to the railway lines up above. That was how you had to visualize it as you're coming into St. Ina Station than it is from down below, but it's still a really spectacular building. And for some weird reason, it's not even listed. And I can't figure out why would you not list a building that's as grand as that? Bonkers. Um, so, okay, move, moving on a bit more. Stockwell Street and the Bridge Gate. Um, so as you enter this, um, there's this great moment. This is one of my favorite tenements in Glasgow. So, and it's McDonald again. This is 1905 by this point. And he's really pulling out all the stops. This is very French influence. And that hole with the adequate that you get on the bay on the corner, very posh. It's the kind of thing you come across in Hindland, but he's doing it right in the heart of the city. And it's a really great complex, this one. And it's, um, so it's a series of tenements, but then you've also got an office block in there as well, which is this building here, which is now being converted to flats, but it's just so grand. And then again, the use of symbology in it. So it's the Glasgow coat of arms. So this is on the balcony at the kind of the first floor level. So there's the bell, the tree, the fish, and the bird. So it's all really subtly done, but it's telling you, you know, that this is a, it's got a civic presence. It's a building for the city. And it's so grand as you enter into, you know, the city center from the Gorbals. It's making a real statement. You've arrived. This is the gateway to the city center. So, and then if we head up to the high street and then the Bell of the Bray, and again, uh, part of what Carrick is doing is kind of, he's being very careful in kind of how he realigns these streets makes them easier to get up, makes them broader. And also he's thinking very carefully about views as he does that. So for him, even though this medieval city gets swept away, he does keep key buildings. Obviously the cathedral, as far as he's concerned, is the most important building in the city. So he's very keen to have good views to the cathedral. And he's also keen to preserve the other churches as well. So they all end up becoming vistas in how he plans all of this. So and this is the Bell of the Brave, which was built in two phases. So this is Bur Boston, Burnett and Carruthers architects, um, who are a really good form of tenant architects, but built quite a few commercial buildings in the city centre as well. So, and they're pulling out all the stops. And the irony is that, you know, the original tenements on that street were like a genuine Scottish street, but they try and accentuate everything with all of the motifs that they have in the building, all of the kind of, this is all full, full throated Scottish baronial here. So it's a really superb piece of kind of cityscape and just really enjoyable. We've actually been helping um, fund repairs to two of the tenements. So this is one where the scaffold has just dropped. So it's that, that tenement there. So the scaffold's just dropped on that. We've redone the roof on it and we're doing the, the one on the corner as well, which I'll get onto in a second. But they're just really beautiful tenements. And they just they have the right amount of gravitas as you're heading up to the, the cathedral. When you think of all that's kind of happened on that street, you know, William Wallace fought a battle on that street. It's an incredibly important street to Glasgow. So it was deserving of a really good bit of cityscape. 
So that's at Nan scaffolding. And we've been up on the roof and kind of that roof is so complex. I really feel for the people living inside there because it's just, it's like, you know, it must be a total nightmare to drain. Um, but it's just, it's fascinating to see how they put the whole thing together. And it's just, it's such a set piece in the city. So, and then we've moved down. This is like the super block that they create on Trongate, Albion Street and Bell Street. So, and this is then kind of, it's starting with kind of, a, again, it's tenements aimed for the working class, but they're also quite grand tenements. So you've got a city coat of arms sitting at the top of it and that first step gable, and you gradually work around the block with more tenements, the sites become available. <laughs> And then you get this enormous warehouse that they get Thompson and Sandy Lands to build. And Thompson is John Thompson, who is Alexander Wick Thompson's son. And Sandy Lands, John Sandy Lands, is he's not called a Beaux Arts trained architect. So, a real top of the line architect, really knows his stuff. And these warehouses, which are now Commonwealth House, are just incredibly grand. And you end up with this phenomenal Baroque corner, which is one to me, it's such a memorable moment when you're looking down Argyle Street towards Glasgow Cross, it almost eclipses, you know, the tall, tall, tall steeple, which obviously you don't really want to do. Um, but it is, it is that grand. And sadly, we lost um, the Tontine Hotel in a fire in 1911. So that, that building ends up getting extended across the site of what was the Tontine um, Hotel. Um, so, but it is an incredibly grand building, but it's just when you look at the scale of these things and you appreciate what was there beforehand, the complexity of the city has kind of diminished as a consequence of that. This is modernity arriving in Glasgow. So everybody kind of looks at these buildings and thinks they're really ancient and they're not. This didn't end up getting finished until kind of 1912. So it's not really that old. It makes you think that it's old, but it's not actually. And it ends up, there's a plaque on it to celebrate the fact that um, James Watt had his um, workshop was on that site. So it's in one of the lanes just at the back of the site, but the lane no longer exists. It's tucked under the building. So um, it's just a completely different scale of city that you're dealing with. So let's keep going. And then this is my favorite one. So this is Bell Street as it was photographed by Thomas Allen in 1868. So you can see how tight the street is at that point. Um, and then you go forward to, I took this just the other day, and you get, that's Alexander B. McDonald's kind of the, the last big warehouse that he built. Um, opposite Burnet and Boston, that was Bose Emporium on the other side. So you can get the completely different feel of terms of the scale, the quality of the buildings, the width of the street, how they kind of gradually blow apart the city in order to get ventilation and light through it. It's all there. It's incredibly grand. And by this point, McDonald, he's kind of, he's really challenged the best architects of the day. So he's taking quotes from Sir John James Burnett and from John Archibald Campbell when he's designing buildings like that. They're incredibly competent. So what was their legacy? Okay. It's mixed. So they didn't solve the problems of what to do with housing in Glasgow. It was mainly displaced. Their criticism was such they ended up buying two estates over Newton Estate, which still partially survives. So that's kind of um, towards the, sort of the west end of Finiston and just kind of it's between Finiston and York Hill. And the streets are still there and some of the buildings are still there, but it's largely being redeveloped and um, partially demolished. And then the other area that they bought was Oatlands. Now, everything in Oatlands has been demolished with the exception of the church, which is desperately wanting repair. And I know that's something that Glasgow Building Preservation Trust have been looking at in the past. Um, but whole swathes of the city were kind of swept away and completely remodeled. So essentially, rather than this ancient part of the, build of the, the city, you get what is kind of just a sort of very kind of, it's a very good um, Victorian city that kind of replaces it, very grand city in places, but it's not that medieval city, it's a new city effectively. And that kind of, that, the germ of that seed keeps going in a kind of large region psyche. So you kind of get this idea, well, if you have a problem, you can just demolish it and start again. And by this point in 1945, with the idea with um, Robert Bruce, who's the, the, the chief planner at this point, is just sweep away the entire city centre and start again. Everything, you know, the city chambers, Glasgow School of Art, the whole lot, it can go and we'll kind of have this proto-Soviet city in its place. 
which kind of, you know, looks as though it's come straight out of warfare. And he actually invents a little helicopter kind of gyropopter thing that's going to fly you around the city as part of this. And you're thinking, you've been to too many world fairs, mate. This is not a good idea. So, and it's, he, he wants to demolish Central Station, move it to the south of the city. It's, it's start again, but you can see where that leads in the course of the 20th century, that you get things like the comprehensive development areas, and there are 27 of them in Glasgow, and that the, the city is therefore viewed as expendable, um, that the communities in the city, well, you can just displace them, does it really matter? Of course it does. We now know how important that is to urban health and that, you know, how, how a city surrounds you and, and encompasses you and that your memories that you associate with a place are so key to kind of your health and well-being. And that people like, I mean, I'm a real fan of Sir Harry Burns and what Harry Burns says about the kind of urban health and the impact of Glasgow, maybe that is why we have problems like the Glasgow effect, because we're too keen to kind of bulldoze our city and start again from scratch. We can't keep doing that. You know, at some point you have to draw a line and say, no, we have to work with what we've got um, and we have to invest in ourselves instead. So, and it's this, this is to me, it's, it's the, the tragedy of the whole thing. And again, it's interesting because all of this and what they do with, um, with Glasgow when it, when it becomes a high rise city from the 60s and the 70s onwards, they tie it to infrastructure again, but rather than being railways this time, it's roads. And it's what happens with the inner, inner ring road and the motorways that are to come off that. But you're not dealing with a human scale city anymore by this point. This is all designed from the point of view of roads. And the Scottish Motorway Archive, which is well worth a look at when you have a look at that and you appreciate how actually the, the, the M8 motorway was designed. There's some real subtleties in it, but it still fails because it's to do with the car. It's not to do with people. And cities should be about people. So um, if you look at that, this is where the tragedy begins to emerge from the whole thing. This is, this is um, John Burnett Sr.'s amazing warehouse, which was on Mollendiner Street. So it's the Mollendiner Street warehouse, which survived until about 1974. There, John Hume photographs of it. And it's kind of, it's been a bit kind of, um, by, this, by that point, a lot of the, the ornament has been stripped off it. It's been quite simplified. But all of these areas of the city were sterilized by the fact that they were effectively what the Americans, Americans would call redlined. Um, the, the, the people who owned these areas knew that development was coming, they knew that the motorway was going to sweep through them, they knew that all these buildings were going to be condemned, and therefore no investment went into these buildings for the best part of half a century. And so they gradually fell apart. And that was just what happened. So we had this kind of magnificent Parisian-inspired city, and we just let it decay away, and, um, and, and ultimately we bulldozed it. And the real tragedy for me in that is the Gorbals, what happened in the Gorbals. Um, just, you know, I, I, and I spoke to um, Reverend John Harvey. It was, we, did, we did a podcast on this about 18 months ago, and I really enjoyed We got them together with Stuart Baird from the Scottish Motorway Archive, and I really enjoyed the discussion we had with the two of them. Because, you know, what John Harvey was telling us, he lived on Abbotsford Place, in a flat in Abbotsford Place, and he talked about how difficult it was to demolish Abbotsford Place. And Abbotsford Place was such a grand street, as good as anything in Edinburgh's new town. And okay, it had fallen on hard times, um, but it could have been, you know, it could, it could have been repaired and conserved rather than just being bulldozed. And he was talking about the irony was it was incredibly difficult to bulldoze because it had been so well built. Um, but when you look at what the Gorbals was like, and this is, um, this is Gorbals Cross. So if you imagine where we are at the moment, um, that, and this is Greek Thompson, beautiful Greek Thompson warehouse, that is where the Glasgow Sheriff Court is now. So that's kind of the car park at the back of the Glasgow Sheriff Court. And this over here is the Glasgow Central Mosque. And you're looking up towards, I can't remember whether they're Stirling Fold or Norfolk Courts. At that point, I think it's Norfolk Courts. Those two huge hulking tower blocks. Now I come from Hong Kong, so I can really appreciate a good tower block. Those aren't good tower blocks. Um, and you can see, you know, what the, what the city was like and how incredibly, I mean, okay, this by this point, the buildings are in a really bad way. But it's so Parisian influence with this great kind of cross at the heart of it, and it all gets bulldozed. It's such a shame. And it is incredibly grand. If only it had been repaired instead. Um, it's definitely, it's one of Glasgow's great tragedies. And John Harvey talked about how they, they petitioned, he was part of the Gorbals group, and how they petitioned the council, and they got councillors to come down and see them, and they tried to convince them not to sweep away the neighbourhood and the communities, and it all just fell on deaf ears. The council decided that it had this notorious reputation as the worst slum in Western Europe, and they were getting rid of it, and that was that. 
And that was what they did. But when you look at all the kind of the fine streets and the layout of the streets and the work that John Carrick and the City Improvement Trust did, you just think it's such a tragedy. Um, and this is Main Street, which is the Gorbal Street. And so the, the British Linen Bank still survives. It's still there. It's been beautifully restored by Southside Housing Association and Page and Park Architects. But that was the baths in front of it. And so you get all these buildings designed by um, Alexander Bree Thompson, um, by David Thompson, not related to each other, um, but he was um, Charles Wilson's kind of chief assistant. So really good architects who were working for the City Improvement Trust. And then if we go to the other side, you get um, the citizens, which is there as the pal Palace Theatre. So that facade actually comes that come, came from Ingram Street, and that was the facade of what's now Corinthian. So it was taken down stone by stone and moved to become the facade of the, what becomes the Palace Theatre, and now the Citizens Theatre. So, and you can see just how grand that whole block was. Unfortunately, there was a fire in kind of think 1877, which very badly damages the facade, which is why it ends up coming down. But the rest of the block is just completely bulldozed to be replaced by nothing, because you know the motorway was going to come through there, and of course it never did. And so all of the, these new tower blocks were all built for the scale of the motorway. And I should say, these are not my photographs, they come from Peter Mortimer's book on um, the Gorbals. So, um, they are really superb and I highly recommend getting that book because it just shows you what this lost city was like. It's this to me is Glasgow's tragedy. And that was what Main Street was like before the City Improvement Trust. So it's like history repeating itself. Before the City Improvement Trust got their hands in it, that was what um, you know, Gobel's Main Street was like. So it's actually a very traditional Scottish street. And yet they swept it away to be replaced. And now, this is what it's like now with the Citizens Theatre. So that's Bennett Associates kind of new kind of reception box that's sitting on front of the Citizens Theatre, with John Mossman's statues at least being reinstated on, on the top of it. But it does kind of make you realise just how much we lost there. It, should, it, would, have, it would have been the most fantastic, you know, really interesting neighbourhood um, with such a fantastic community in it, and yet all swept away for nothing, as far as I can see. The tower blocks really, I remember visiting them when um, uh, I, I came over to Glasgow for the for the for the garden festival and just being horrified coming from Hong Kong. The key thing when people were building tablocks and Hong Kong went through the same problems that Glasgow had in Victorian times: explosive population growth. We had you know people coming over the border from China. The city's population was expanding massively. You had to house people somewhere. They put them in tower blocks, but they learned all the lessons from Glasgow that we got wrong here. So all the tower blocks had amenities at the base of them. In Glasgow, there was nothing at the base of them. What, what were you meant to do? And so to me, just have wasted a city like that, that's such a huge tragedy. A city is a terrible thing to waste. Don't do it. Mm -hmm. So that, to me, is the kind of main legacy from this. And the other thing, thinking about as well, we have these significant problems in the city centre at the moment with a lot of vacancy, upper floor level vacancy. I think there are 450 buildings in the city centre, kind of Georgian, Victorian, Edwardian, interwar, that don't have any use in them at the moment. We need to think about what we do about those things. Maybe we should be looking at some kind of vehicle that can overhaul the city centre, not in such a ruthless way, but get people back living in the city centre and looking at amenity and kind of looking at it in the holistic way that the Victorians did and see if we can get a better Glasgow out of that. So that's my key pitch and learning from this. So I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dave, for that incredibly detailed talk. I'm looking forward to visiting the song again. Thank you. Um, we are just about on time, but I wonder if we could maybe take one or two questions if anyone had any. Yeah? Hi, Jerome. So, really great talk. Can you just hold the microphone a little bit closer? So, um, a couple of bits of information on the question. I'll let you stop and stick to one. Um, the reason why uh, the um, station was moved on a down street or an accessible level and had everything been right. um, it had been decided before I ever came to work for Glasgow City Council that um, the, the establishment or what the the uh, dial and station will be established because it's much nearer to all the 
retail functions depending on the city centre. So that's the reason why it's moved. I'm certainly regrettable because of what has happened since in relation to the city being defined and crossway and all that. Um, the second bit of information in relation to that is that we'll find the panel, the barrier that stood around the uh, Glasgow station, we'll find those reviews in the St. Vincent place. That's right, the toilet. The supplies, yeah. Right. The supplies, yeah too. My question is, I think, for several uh, improvement trust acts, the other ones are kind of they're extend they're extending the powers because they, they realize that they haven't done everything they set out to do. So it's about extending the powers. Some of the other ones are also doing with building control issues. Um, the eighteen ninety two one is critical because that's the point after Carrick has died that they've released the kind of building regulations so things like the, the heights and the streetscapes can start to vary more after that point the mcdonald does exercise quite a big degree of control so there are things like that that come out of the police acts are absolutely critical too and this is something we also we don't associate the police with having a role in the built environment but the police absolutely did at one point and so there were things like the police would have to check the number of people who were in the room um, so there's ticketing of the houses to say that, you know, the houses was X size, therefore only so many people were allowed into it, but things like that were widely abused. So, you know, there, there were things like that, the police did have quite a lot of control over things like sanitation as well. All of those things just, the police would have a role in. Um, the same with the Dean of Guild would have control of what the buildings would look like. So, yeah, all of those things are very important for the purposes of the city. One I for there's a lot of social housing, and I found it quite interesting uh, when you were talking about day to level and the way that the tenements are designed. There's a lot of thought and real craftsmanship and celebration of architecture. And I, I wondered when it comes to modern day social housing, often things can look like a skin. And I wonder if there are lessons that you could learn from the people's trust. Um, approach to building on maps that we can use now. And we've got things like design and build contracts to contain with and so it's a you know um like the center of Scottish uh, sort of housing funding is the Uville, got conservation and we have so many pressures. So how do we as architects sort of encourage the celebration of architecture and craftsmanship again? I think that to be in that um Politics, you think that in there you have to be um, speaking up for architecture as a kind of you know, for, for what it can do, and you have to be in there when I was in and things like the, the city development plan is up for renewal at the moment, so there'll be a big consultation like that. You should be in there arguing for good policies that support good design as part of that. One of the things when I was doing the charrette and these policy shields and what I was doing, um, our problem sounds incredibly arcane. Um, but one of the things that we got for the consultants back were collective architects and a fun called dress with the weather, who really good, good two forms of architects, was I said to them that uh, the design of any new buildings and the kind of thing, because we're, we're, we're looking at the huge gap sites between, kind of between these port shields and the, kind of the southern end of the globals, and what happened in those. And so what I said to them was that rather than have a really complex design code. I wanted two sides of A4, like, uh, like what your title deeds are like if anyone has ever seen title deeds. Um, so two sides of A4 that very simply tell you what should go in any particular site. And as part of that, what I encouraged them to do was to look at things like ornament. And because to me, ornament is really important for being able to kind of personalize what your environment is like. And ornament is what's called a human universal. All cultures do it. All human cultures do this. So I think ornament, you know, it was modernism swept ornament away. It didn't do it in Sweden, but it tried to on a basis that it was frivolous and superfluous. I don't think it is. I think it serves an absolute key function. And I think it helps. Um, it's all to do with how you identify your, 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 yourself in space and how you relate to buildings. So I think, and as part of that design code, I said that they had to ensure 
that each of the closes of the new building had it, it had its own identity, and that that should they perhaps should take cues from pollock shields like the color of the welling tiles and the closes, things like that, just to kind of add color because it helps with your memory and it helps to locate yourself in the space as you go around the city. Things like that are really critical. So yeah, I will agree for that. Okay, uh, please join thank you my theory. Thank you very much for being here today. The next talk in this space is going to be by Will Knight. He's going to be talking about his approach to updating building the map with new management in his talk. So if you'd like to join us that one, please do the space. Thank you.